The Tolkien Road, Episode 24, The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Book 1, Chapter 2, The Shadow of the Past. Hi everyone, John Carswell here. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, where we explore Middle-earth and the incredible works and ideas of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings with Chapter 2 of Fellowship, The Shadow of the Past. While consisting mostly in dialogue, I consider this to be one of the prime examples of why I love Tolkien's style so much. Along the way, we discuss our love of Sam Gamgee and how anyone could possibly not love him as well as engage in a brief, though heated, discussion of the literary merits of The Hunger Games. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And of course, if you haven't already, please leave us a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast. Enjoy the show! Hello everyone, welcome to The Tolkien Road, your conversational guide to Middle-earth and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Thanks for tuning in, this is... John Carswell, as always, with my co-host, Greta Carswell. How are you, Greta? I'm doing spectacular. Great. Meeting, recording a little earlier this week to, uh, so that you're not falling asleep on me this time like right. you were at the end of the last one. Mm-hmm. Slacker. Man, oh man, I'll tell you oh, what. No, I am, I am a lightweight in more ways than one. I'm, just, I'm telling you, man. Okay. So, um, well. I'm going to bring it to this, br- I'm going to bring it. Bring it on. This, I was going to say, this episode, I'm going to bring it. You better, we you better get to the, we better get to the epi- end of this episode and I better be saying to myself, man, Greta really brought it this time. Yeah, you will not know what hit you. No. <laughs> You'll be like, what just happened? What? <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> well, that's, um. Uh, that's what I like to hear. Mm-hmm. You've got spirit. Mm-hmm. All right. At least I can talk big. So on this episode, we are going to be discussing the second chapter of The Fellowship of the Ring, mm-hmm. The Shadow Getting of good. the Past. Getting good. Getting good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I I love this chapter. So, so this is one of my favorite chapters in all of Tolkien. Um, and we'll get to reasons why on that here in just mm-hmm. a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Let's, let's start out, as always, with our haikus. Haikus! Yeah. And, um... Uh, Has I, anybody submitted music yet? No. But no. we did have somebody, actually, a couple weeks... I feel kind of bad, because uh, back on June 1st, and today is the... What? The 17th? Yeah. Um, a Twitter follower named Joshua Sosa um, actually submitted a haiku for us. <gasps> and um Sweet. Yeah, so I thought I'd go ahead and read that. Thanks for submitting. Thanks, yeah. thanks for, uh, thanks for noticing. <laughs> um, That's awesome. I can't believe you like didn't tell me about this well, for the last two weeks. Sorry. Well, here you go. So I'll read it for you. Can't wait. All right. Baggins is their name. Frodo and Uncle Bilbo, in their home, Bagend. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's really good. There you go. Good job, Josh. Nice. I dig it. Well, we. Hey, hold on here. We don't know for sure. We don't have permission to call him Josh. Let's call him Joshua. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what, I thought that's what you said. It I said Josh. Joshua. He did say Joshua. Joshua. Right on, Joshua. Joshua. That rocked. That rocked. And, um, yeah, he's got kind of a cool little picture of himself with a stormtrooper there. So, and maybe he's the stormtrooper. He's just taking pictures. He's, oh. he's, he's the stormtrooper getting his picture taken with, uh, with like, a random fan or something like that, you know? That could be cool. I don't know. It's very ambiguous, Joshua. I can't tell which one you are. So, anyway, no. Thanks for uh, thanks for submitting your haiku. And yes. and like I said, please keep them coming. And um, and everyone else, please keep them coming. I, let's just have. I want like, I want to be just deluged with awesome Tolkien haikus. Me too. Yeah. Let's get so. enough. Let's get enough haikus that we could just devote an entire episode. Two haikus. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. That that might just be too much haiku awesomeness. I don't know if I could. 
Mm. If I can handle that. I bet I, I bet we can make it awesome. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like haiku is better in small little snippets. Um, now who's the lightweight, Johnny? Well, maybe mm. maybe we'll let you do a special episode all by yourself where you <laughs> just do, do haikus. This is the Tolkien Haiku Podcast with Greta. Hey, Welcome. that actually, I really that like was that was a haiku idea. itself, where everything is spoken in haiku. <laughs> <Your> haiku. <laughs> all that right. could be really fun. Yeah. I'm going to think about that. So it might be a future spinoff for this series. <laughs> uh, we'll let you know. I so. think that would be a great idea. All right, you got some haiku? I do. I all got right. four. Ooh, all right. Well, since you have four, I only have three, so you better start. All right. All right, here's number one. I'll do them chronologically, based on the um, how things happen and the check-in chapter. And I tried really hard this time, and I hope this comes out, but it may not. So I'm going to be very clear here that I did try to make my haikus less about just the events and the facts. I really tried hard to go for themes and overall kind of feelings that were that were mm-hmm. going on in the chapter. Mm-hmm. So I, I did try to go a little deeper. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But it may not come out, so. Let's just, let's just let the haiku be I the just want you to know that I tried. Okay. <laughs> All right, here's my first one. Okay. The ring has Frodo and Gandalf quite perturbed. But courage they must have. That was like a Yoda haiku. That was like my inner Yoda. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Courage they must have. <laughs> You have a good Yoda voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you, I think. I thought I really like that word perturbed too. Perturbed. I was glad that I could. Perturbed. Work it perturbed. It's only two syllables of per. Yeah. Can you read it again? Yeah, the ring has Frodo, and Gandalf quite perturbed, but courage they must have. Nice. Mm-hmm. I like it. All, All right. right. Um. Yeah, so here's one for me. Okay. Stories in stories and legends abound. Dark arts to light up the day. Hmm. Dark arts to light up the day. It's a little ironic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. It's good. Yeah. I'm kind of proud of that one, actually. I like Can you that read one. the first part again? Stories in stories and stories le- in stories, yeah, or and in stories, the so stories in stories, okay, and legends abound, dark arts to light up the day. Very nice, I yeah. like that. I like that word, legend. Yes, cool word. All right, um, here's my next one unpleasant rumors, strange behaviors cause concern, evil is spreading. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice, good. Thanks. All right. Next on the agenda for me. Mm-hmm. Seventeen years. That's a long time to be unsure of such grave peril. Seventeen years. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's really good. I like your first one better though. All right, here's my third one. Pulling wicked strings, the Dark Lord bids the ring, come, that I might rule all. Nice. Mm-hmm. I like the wicked strings, if I may toot my own horn. I like to see him as like this evil like puppet master. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Wicked strings. Wicked strings. Wicked strings. Doing that thing. I'm just. <laughs> I'm sorry, just pulling no, the strings. Stop. Doing my thing. You love it when I song. Uh, All right, we'll stop. Gosh. All right. Just stop. Yeah. Why did okay. you start that? <laughs> <sighs> All right. Uh, my last one. Outside the window, Sam trims, hearing tales of elves that draw him inside. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I love that. I love how they do that in the movie. Yeah. With Sam just, you know, doing his thing and then I'll... Anyway. <laughs> doing his thing. <laughs> Dang. You did it. You did it to yourself <laughs> that time. I Anyway, I, I, like, I like that part of the chapter. Mm-hmm. It's good. 
And I love Sam. I do. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's my um, my last one, which also includes Sam. Um, okay, here it is. As Shire Savior, Frodo feels inadequate. At least he'll have Sam. Right on. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Can't do much yeah. better than Sam. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, uh, it's kind of impossible. I mean... I'm sure there's people out there who like don't who don't like Sam or whatever and um but it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, you imagine those people like don't like puppy dogs in sunny days exactly. either. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I was going to say there's like the the people that probably like Gollum. Yeah. Don't like Sam. Yeah, you know, it's probably like um I don't know, it just seems it seems uh Seems like there must be something wrong with you if you don't like Sam. Yes. But I don't know. Maybe there's somebody out there who doesn't like Sam that wants to take issue with that. And uh, you're free to do so. Make the case. Um, we'll just, uh, you know. We'll have to agree to guess, disagree with you right here, right now. Well, yeah. 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 We'll just, you know, let you make the case and then won't even bother responding to you <laughs> after you write a really long email to us. Because <laughs> that's how we roll. <laughs> just to, Just to show you that you're a bad person. Basically, right, yeah. no. Seriously, if uh, you know, hey, we're always open for conversation. Absolutely, on this yeah. If there is somebody out there that does not like Sam, let us know why, please. Why in the world? So we can talk you out of it. That's right. Yeah. All right. Let's get rolling on this let's thing. Do this. All right. So, chapter two: the shadow of the past. Uh, like I said, I love this chapter. Um, I didn't take the time to like list out all the attributes of it that are why I love it, but let me just kind of. It's just kind of free flow, stream of consciousness on this. I'm going to stop you if you if you get going too long. That's good. Mm-hmm. Good. Um, so, I think what I really love about this chapter is um, is pro- maybe what a lot of people don't like about it because they feel like it's um, it's too much talking. You know, it's too much like I fucking love dialogue. Do people not like dialogue? I don't know. I, I'm I'm just I'm just speculating here, but um I I that's kind of the re it's not just that it's dialogue, but it's just that you can see the whole like the depth of the world that Tolkien has created is is un, is kind of unfurling, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, you go back to mm-hmm. on fairy stories and that whole idea of enchantment. And to me that's one of the things that draws me over and over again to Tolkien is the depth of the world he created and this sensation that you could walk into that world, you know? Yeah. Um, that is a, um, that's just one of his key contributions to, to literature in my opinion yeah. is, um, that, that kind of insistence on the greatness of, of taking the time to craft something that feels real, yes. you know? Yes. And I feel like he does that ex- with a lot of success in this chapter. And world that um, you get lost in that you can, yeah. Really become a part yeah. Of it. I mean, there's just there's like you get the sense just from reading. It's it's almost like what what the brilliance of what he does here is that he tells you just enough. And he tells you a lot, but he tells you just enough to have you wanting to know a lot more, and like you mm-hmm. feel like there's all these blanks that you'll never know about. And he, you know, there's that one part where Gandalf is basically like, "Well, I don't need to explain all of my comings and goings to you, but um, but you know, I have been gone for a long time, and just trust me, I've right. been around and I've been reading lots of." I've been doing lots of research and mm-hmm. finding people and, you know, figuring all this out, you know. Yeah. Yep. So, um, oh. you know, there's, to me, there's bad storytelling is where it feels like it's just kind of set up on a stage and it does, and it just feels like, you know, the world doesn't feel. I'll say this. I'll be a little controversial here because I know, I know you like, uh, so the Hunger Games. Let's talk about the yes. Hunger Games really mm-hmm. quick. All right. Um I I I don't have a big problem with the Hunger Games. I like the Hunger Games. You know, I enjoyed reading the first one, and the second one. I, I finding the third one a little slow, um, but uh, I will say that that world feels very contrived. Like it just feels like it's there for like the details of the whole like political situation and all that. Like the whole how they're set up into different districts and everything mm-hmm. just doesn't seem very well thought through. You know? You don't think so? No, it just seems like... it. It's like, here's the district that provides this, and here's the district that provides this, and they all serve the... Well, it's the... post-apocalyptic. Like, it's obviously not supposed to be what's what we're 
living in right now. I mean, I know Tolkien's world isn't either. But, I mean, that's really interesting that you say that because I read that book and I could actually see that happening. Like, yeah. not now, and hopefully not in my lifetime, but eventually, yeah. I mean, who says that the United States couldn't get divided up into all those places? I mean, it could happen. But that's 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 not exactly what I'm saying, though. Like, it's it's not that you couldn't get divided up into a bunch of different places. I'm saying that it's like they're they're so rigid in what they provide the service or the goods they provide to the capital. Like, that just seems really like sort of just just contrived and and not very well how does that thoroughly affect, thought, I'm assuming that where you're going with this is that you don't feel enchanted by the world mm-hmm. that's created exactly by yeah but I'm, I'm trying to I'm just I'm not as not understanding your argument about why not so it's because the districts are so rigid it, it's not it's not the rigidity of the districts it's the rigidity of how she sets them up the author sets them up right it's like there's no, there, you know, it may have helped some if she had actually like provided a map or something like that to like give a little there more perspective you go on it. With your crazy map. Well, sir, but yeah. that's a part of it. That's a part I of know. the quality of enchantment, I right? There was a map, was there not? Not that I'm aware of. Now you I don't can have a paper. Figure it out though, like if you can read between the lines and figure out where the different districts are. Right. But that's my that's that's my point. Is it again like? So it's just maybe it's, not. It just feels like a, it feels a little silly because. It's like, oh, this is where agriculture comes from, and this is the mining district, and and it just feels like it's if, obviously West Virginia. But but my point is, it's just like that's not how the world really is. Like that's not how geography really is. Like like it's not it's it's never that. Like yes, there are going to be places where there's more stuff of a certain kind comes from that place, but it's like everybody in District Twelve or whatever is a miner, and it's like mm-hmm. what well, that about, was just part of the story. I mean, that was just there to, to feed the plot right and, and and that's kind of my point is like to to enchant it's just not enchanting it doesn't enchant me like like it's it doesn't she doesn't go into any further explanation she doesn't go into any historical background on how it all happened like it's just well yeah that's true it, it's just it's just there it just is what it is it is what it is well, I think there's a little bit of background and it's, but and it's at the service it's at the service of of the of of this plot you know. But see, I don't think, see, this is where I don't think that she meant for you to get lost in the world of the districts. I think where she means you to get lost is in the arena. Because that's where all really most of the big time action happens. I mean, you need the districts to feed the, you know, to feed the storyline to get you to the arena. Right? Uh-huh. But that's really the coolest part of those books, or how those arenas are set up. I can't remember the first one, but I know the second one with the clock, you know, and all those different things yeah. happening. You know, that's where that's where she means you to get lost, in my opinion. But I don't, but, I mean, I don't really, again, like, it, it doesn't, I don't know, it, it just, I, my point is, um, and, and I think that, um, I think it would be crazy to try and say that she does... And, and and to be fair, she probably maybe you know she probably isn't going for it, but I feel like that's where I have not connected with those books. And I'm just saying me. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that I'm not mm-hmm. saying that anybody else you know p- other people are bad. Right. But she doesn't enchant like you and don't that's find her world and, enchanting. exactly like and I don't think I, I think that's a failure of those works in my mm-hmm. opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, but again, you know, it's not really a show about me. Attacking the Hunger Games. It's just an mm-hmm. example that lots of people have probably read. That mm-hmm. I, I could probably say very similar things about um, about the world of Harry Potter, feeling a little bit contrived. Although I think she does a better job over the course of the series of making it seem a little more real. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I do enjoy those books a lot more than mm-hmm. than the other than uh, Hunger Games. But mm-hmm. um, but again, like I just think Tolkien is the master at this and. Um, oh, yeah. That that would be a hard. Yeah. That would be hard so so all of that was really for the sake of comparison. I, I'm really not trying to get into the thing of bashing any other works mm-hmm. about this. I'm just saying that this to me is an example of Tolkien's mastery and skill in this area. In the you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I agree. I mean, I agree. There's, it's a it's it's hard to put down once you get into it for sure. Yeah. Um, but again, that's also a personal taste. I mean, there are some people that can't get into Tolkien, right? I mean, well, they're, they're bad people. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> They're the same people that don't like Sam. <laughs> right. Probably. <laughs> One and the same. All right. All right. So, um, 
So uh, let me just start out. What what um, what jumped out at you in this in this chapter? Uh, uh, what do you what do you what do you have want to talk about? Because I can talk about some stuff, but about. what do you yeah, want to talk about? Um, what do you want to talk what do about? I want to talk about where do I start? Well, I really um, I was really intrigued by the little discussion that happened at the Green Dragon mm-hmm. between Sam and Ted Sandyman, where. Um, where Sam is basically uh, just sharing kind of things that he's heard and seen and, you know, kind of being like, hey, there's some strange stuff going on. Like, you know, what do you guys think of this? And, you know, Ted is obviously very much in denial. He's like, oh, Mm -hmm. you know, he has a way to laugh it all off, you know. But I think this is really, I think, the beginning where you can see that there's something, something is going on. Something's brewing, Mm -hmm. right? And, um... And Sam, I think, is kind of trying to get people's guards up, right? Yeah. I mean, like, listen, we need to, you know, we need to be aware. But it seems like everybody, he's the only one. Everybody else is like, Psh, whatever. Right. So I found, I just, you know, I don't know if they're in denial or what, but I, I what did you think about that scene? Um, well, I mean, I kind of think Sandy Man is, um, is, a jerk and somebody I don't really like. Um, but, um, but I think also he, he's representative of a certain mindset that, you know, the, the key line is, um, uh, maybe it's the next page. Oh yeah. On, uh, towards the end of the conversation, um, Sam is Sam starts singing the song. They are sailing, sailing, sailing over mm-hmm. the sea. They are going into the west and leaving us. Mm-hmm. Um, he kind of gets into this chant because Sam just like loves the elves, mm-hmm. um, thinks they're the coolest. And Ted laughs at him and says, "Well, this isn't anything new if you believe the old tales. And I don't see what it matters to me or you. Let them sail. But I warrant you haven't seen them doing it, nor anyone else in the Shire." Um, and um, and that to me is just really typical of this sort of incredulous. Uh, attitude this very like skepticism to the extreme sort of attitude that uh, I feel like Tolkien uh, I think he does a good job of not lampooning it here but he definitely sets Sandy Man up in that role Mm -hmm. um, of being a guy who's just like it's like you gotta show you know I'm not gonna believe it till I see it you know Mm -hmm. and with with my own eyes I don't care what other people say they've seen you know this guy says he's seen a walking tree. He probably just saw, you know, this. And, right. oh, you know, Frodo and Bilbo, those guys are cracked, you know. So is that a reference to the Ents, the walking tree? Is that what that was? I think so. Okay. I, I assume so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like he has a way to just explain away everything. Right, you know, exactly. like, oh, well, Bilbo. And they're like, oh, Bilbo's crazy. Oh, well, Fro- Frodo's crazy, too. Yeah. You know, he's one of those people who is just like, they have... You know, they, they just have they have an answer to everything, right? And 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 they're just it's this incredulous attitude where they're not. It's it's not a it's not a mindset that says, "Wow, that's interesting." You know, mm-hmm. like I wonder what that's all about. You yeah. know, that's one thing. You don't have to necessarily say, "I believe that there were walking walking tree men about." You know, right? But you could say, "That's weird." Right? You know? Exactly. And I feel like yeah. the world is so much more like that. You know, uh, I mean, you don't have to believe everything you hear happening is like you know some kind of spooky mysterious force at work you know right Uh, but even so you can be like that's weird you know yeah you can at least entertain the thought for a minute and really well it's not even just entertaining the thought but it's like it's it's at least suspending judgment and saying like i'm not the final say on this right you know yeah yeah um and i think um you know i think tolkien is um it's you know he, he i think he's it, I, and, and part of me feels like I was going to say I should have said this earlier, but I was going to uh, I was thinking as I read this that this first part almost feels like Tolkien is fictionalizing and enacting um, on fairy stories. Like he's taking some mm-hmm. of the key concepts and on fairy stories, and he's starting to like kind of weave them into a story all themselves. Like some of the some of the ideas he talks about in there, and you know he talks about. Throughout a lot of Tolkien's works, he will show people who are not, um, who have a very modern mindset and are sort of like, um, you know, oh, all of that old stuff about the old, the old legends and all that. That's just, that's just bunk. You know, it's all children's stories, all that kind of stuff. 
they call um, it more material or don't, materialistic and let's, industrial. Let's tell mindset. something. Let's tell about reality. You know, the, right. the hardcore reality. Let's talk about technological advancements. Let's talk. Yeah, and let's talk about the things that we can see. Right. Right. And um, and I think he's he's setting mm-hmm. up Sam as this guy who the modern mind is willing is looks at and would say like Sam's a fool and he's and he believes mm-hmm. all of these old shysters mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um, like Frodo and Bilbo and he's he's totally credulous he's just willing to believe anything but but Sam isn't Sam no, Sam not. is not like oh all of this stuff is most certainly true you know right. um, Sam's just even in the face of Sandman he's like okay well. But what do you think of this? And you know, but Sam doesn't have enough of his own experience to kind of rebut and you know, and not realize that everybody's laughing at him right now. Right. Yeah, he's know? a little naive in that way. Yeah. But he he definitely, and I think this is also Tolkien's way of, of this is really the largest. I think this is one of the first really good introductions we're getting to Sam. Mm-hmm. And I know he was mentioned in the first chapter, but I feel like you get much more of an insight into his character, and um, you know, and just how how his mind works and I think Tolkien is really setting him up here as somebody who um who will be a good companion for Frodo. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Oh definitely, yeah. yeah. Um yeah, so um I, good great scene there. Um I also want to point out a little or just before that when um I really like the description. So so one thing that really is interesting to me in this as compared with the movie is that between chapter one and chapter two, did you pick up on how long transpires? Um, no, I did not. Do you have any sense of that from reading? Well, I know they talked about Bilbo throwing a birth. I mean, a Frodo throwing a birthday party for Bilbo every year. Yeah. Um, oh, it says so. It went on until his forties, running out. Oh, his fiftieth birthday is drawing near. Near. Yeah. So, oh, seventeen years. Seventeen years. 17 yeah. Years. That's kind of crazy to me because. Um, when I read, like when you watch the movies, um, uh, yeah, which makes such a strong yeah. impression on you. I mean, that uh, you know, the Jackson movie, like the Fellowship of the Ring of the Jacks is my favorite of the three Lord of the Rings Jackson movies. And, and part of it is because I love the way he handles the Shire um, and, and the early scenes in the story. Um, but... There's no sense of 17 years. No, expiring. I mean Frodo looks like when they said yeah. that his 50th birthday was drawing near. I do. I remember thinking, yeah. being like, "Whoa, he didn't look like he was close to 50 in the movie." Yeah. Well, of course, hobbits have a longer lifespan. They do have too. a longer yeah. lifespan, but still, he did not look like he had changed at all. Yeah, like 33 is is about 18 for a for a hobbit, I think. Right, okay. 16. Okay. It's like it's almost like 16 for 18 or for. A yeah, hobbit or it's like, like they're you know? they're coming of age. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 17 years expire and. Um, and Frodo, this whole time, he's kind of he's enjoying his his life. He's enjoying being mm-hmm. the master of Bag End, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time, he's starting to develop a wanderlust. You know, he's um, Frodo began to feel restless, and the old paths seemed too well trodden. He looked at maps and wondered what lay beyond their edges. Maps made in the Shire showed mostly white spaces beyond its borders. He took to wandering further afield and more often by himself. And Mary and his other friends watched him anxiously. Often he was seen walking and talking with the strange wayfarers that began at this time to appear in the Shire. So um, Frodo is, he, he's feeling this itch to get up and, and go somewhere. Mm-hmm. He, as mm-hmm. much as he loves the Shire, as much as he lo- he's enjoying his life, and, you know, it sounds like he has a pretty idyllic life, right? It's it's mm-hmm. just, he's hanging out in Bag End, and, you know, I don't think he really, he like, is... You know, has like a day to day job he has to attend to. He's no, he's, just he's just independent. Showing. You know, he's he's inherited all this wealth from mm-hmm. from uh, Bilbo, and he's the master of Bag End, and he just gets to kind of hang out and and go yeah. kind good of life. traveling in the Shire wherever he wants to. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's got a mate. He has some good friends, and yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's got he's got a nice setup. Right, right. Um, all right, so Sam. Let's go back to the bar. Sam is walking home, and um, that night, and that happens to be the same night um, that Gandalf reappeared, or the, right. at the same time it says that Gandalf reappeared after a long absence mm-hmm. um, of about uh, nine years since the last time he had come and gone in the seventeen years since the party, right. um, a few times, and then it had been about nine years. It says it had since been a stretch of nine years. Yeah, since Frodo, Frodo had last seen him. Seen him. Okay. Um, so. 
it just says that he showed back up when uh, he showed back up at Frodo's uh, door, and uh, he he spent the night at Frodo's house. Mm-hmm. And the next day, um, over breakfast, um, or the, the next day in the morning, um, Frodo says to him, "Last night you began to tell me strange things about my ring, Gandalf." And then you stopped because you said that such matters were best left until daylight. Don't you think you had better finish now? You say the ring is dangerous, far more dangerous than I guess. In what way? And that's where it all kind of starts. And that's where this, you know, launches into this long um, discussion between Gandalf and Frodo where Gandalf basically tells him everything he's learned and what the ring really is. Right. Um, So how much of this, how much of this was familiar to you or like did you... Like, what, were there any things that in this whole section here that were surprising to you, or were things you hadn't realized before oh, as you were reading oh, it? Oh, about like the history. Of yeah, the history of, of the yeah, ring and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I was. Well, I, I definitely. Um, it was nice to get a refresher on kind of the lore uh-huh. of the ring and where you know where where they all started. Um, as far as, you know, you know, what I didn't remember was that what, that is that what had happened to the, so there were elven rings, right? Right. And there were dwarf rings and there were rings for mortal men. Right. And then there was the one ring. Right. And altogether they added up to 20. Okay. Right? Yes. What I did not realize, I remember that the elves had hid their rings. Okay. They, they had three, right? And right. they hid them. And they had not been found. But what I did not remember was that the mortal men, that their rings, that they had all basically been absorbed. Right? Uh-huh. Like they had become, what do they call them, ring wraiths? Or right. I did not remember that. Oh, you didn't remember, did that, remember that they that became, the, the ring wraiths were mortal men? No, yes, exactly. I did not remember yeah. that. Yeah. That was surprising to me. Um. Yeah, and then, you know, the dwarf rings, um, it's interesting because he talks about that three of them, um, I think he says three of them were, where is it? I didn't mark it. Um, basically, they don't know, you know, I think some of them were recovered and then some of them were devoured by dragons at whatever point. So the dwarf rings... Oh, are, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. The dwarf rings aren't really around anymore. Right. Um, but... Um, you know, what did you think about um, Gandalf and sort of his logic for waiting this long to 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 kind of sound the alarm on this? Um, well, doesn't even he admit that he made a mistake? Um, how so? Well, I thought maybe I'm jumping ahead too far, but when he's he's telling Frodo about his, you know, basically about meeting Gollum, right? Uh huh. Oh, wait, there it is. There's what you're talking about, the three. Anyway, okay. So he's talking about meeting Gollum and, um, and you know, about his journeys, you know, out into Mirkwood and stuff like that. And then, and then he says, um, I thought he came right out and said that I made the biggest mistake. He's like, I made, I made a really big mistake mm-hmm. by doing this. Um, well, what he says is, um... Early on, he says, uh, clearly, clearly the ring had an unwholesome power that set to work on its keeper at once. That was the first real warning I had that all was not well. I told Bilbo then that such rings were better left unused, but he resented it and soon got angry. There was little else that I could do. I could not take it from him without doing greater harm. I had no, and I had no right to do so anyway. I could only watch and wait. I might perhaps have consulted Saruman the White, but something always held me back. Mm-hmm. Um, so the only, he kind of defend, he, he, you can tell he was, he was in a pickle about it. Um, you know, he was like, I can't. So he suspected something was wrong, yeah. but he also felt like he couldn't go to the source that would confirm it. Right. Um. Which obviously was smart, right? I mean, because don't you, because, oh, that would be Saruman, not Saruman. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, I was like, yeah, you want to talk, talk to Saruman, Saruman about the ring. Okay. Well, so and um, uh, and he, he's getting later on. We'll learn more about Saruman, um, but Saruman, you know, Saruman is supposed to be kind of Gandalf's 
um, not his boss exactly, but the leader of his order, the guy, you know, the guy that he would default to in, in uh, difficult cases. And oh, okay. um, Saruman is also is is also a Maiar, right? That came. He was one of the five. Sauron and Saruman. No, 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 no. Well, Sa- Sauron is a Maiar, but Saruman is Saruman, not Sauron. Saruman the, the White. Guy. No, Wait. Sauron is the bad guy. Oh, that's why I was confused. Saruman the White is a good guy. Yeah, you remember this, right? The guy with the white beard and the. I remember him, but I feel like I may have been getting him mixed up with Radagast. Oh yeah, don't yeah, don't worry. Yeah, Radagast barely even comes up in the in the books. Um, okay, so Saruman, I do remember Saruman the White. Yeah. So he's he is on Gandalf's side. I mean, right? He's not he has not aligned himself with. Saruman. Well, well, he's supposed he's supposed to be right, and that's the thing. Um, we'll get. We'll get there, and we'll get there in the coming chapters. But but Gandalf was maybe not sure of his allegiance, and that's why he never went to him. It's not clear why he never went to him. He's just saying that something always held him back. He doesn't say if it was something mm-hmm. that within himself an uncertainty, or if it was, mm-hmm. um, or if it was just something else always came up. Right? Yeah. We don't know. Um, but. Um, so what logic does Frodo, does that, is that basically, is that really all that Gandalf says about why he waited this long? Yeah, well, yeah, that's, here that's all he says about it. Okay. Um, he'll get, he'll get into more of that later on, yeah. much later on. Okay. Um. Well, what do you think of his logic? I mean, I think it, I think it fits. I mean, it's, you know, it's not, there's nothing really to, to take strong issue with there, especially we just don't know very much about it. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you could definitely, I mean, you could definitely probably poke holes at it, but Frodo wouldn't have been in a, in a, had any reason to kind of continue prodding him about it. He looks right. at Gandalf and he says, wise wizard, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. He knows what and, and a good friend. So, right. Um, the, uh, let's talk real quick about the effects of the ring. So what were some of the effects mm-hmm. of the ring that you, um, as you understood them? Uh, well, it says that it, um, it, it has a way of getting a hold Mm -hmm. of whoever has it and of, of making, um, making it difficult to part with. Right. Right. Um, and. Well, it says if he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he fades. He becomes, if a mortal does, he becomes in the end invisible permanently and walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power that rules the rings. Right. Um, Yes, sooner or later, later if he is strong or well-meaning to begin with, but neither strength nor good good purpose will last. Sooner or later, the dark power will devour him. So it's interesting to me that, like, um, good good intentions and the more, like, well, uh, the more disposed to goodness... A person, a, a person is who receives one of these rings. The longer it will take for um, the bad effects to for the bad effects to take hold. Right, that, and doesn't even say that when um, this may be jumping ahead a bit too. But when they um, when it's okay to jump around. <laughs> it is okay. Yeah, yeah, I want yeah. to make sure I wasn't messing up your chronological. No, we're doing the whole chapter. Yes, yeah, so we're not. Okay. We're not. Yeah. So later, when um, Gandalf is talking to Frodo about Gollum, and he's describing Gollum to him, and. Um, you know, kind of sharing all that stuff. And Frodo's like, ugh, what a nasty creature. Well, I wish Bilbo had just killed him right then and there when he had the chance. Yeah. And um, Gandalf says, well, it was pity. Pity that, that stayed his hand. And it was because of that, because of that pity, because Bilbo was in that state of kind of having a pitiful heart when he got the ring, that it did not have the effect on him. Right. That it could have. Right. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. Because basically his heart was in the right place. Yeah. You could say when the ring came to him, so it took longer for it to, to right. really... Right. And a little er- earlier than that, Gandalf says, for Bilbo gave it up in the end of his own accord, an important point, right? right Gandalf um, had to help him a whole lot. And if Gandalf hadn't been there, I don't know that he would have, but... Right. Now, you could right. never see Gollum giving it up of his own accord. No, no, no. He would die before yeah. he gave it up. Right. But Bilbo... Um, Bilbo gave it up of his own accord, and that was that was for the benefit of Bilbo ultimately, right? That 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 resulted in a happier end for Bilbo um, that he was able to do that, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and yeah. it had less it had less effect over time on him on Bilbo because of the way 
he got it right, right. Cause if as, it's as opposed mind, to what we learned about Gollum which is that he murdered right a friend in right. order to get the ring right, right. And instead, Bilbo and Bilbo basically did the opposite, right? I mean, he had the opportunity for murder. Right. Right, and he chose not to. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and you know, that's also a good thing to notice about Frodo, is that Frodo, it, Frodo, it's completely neutral how it comes to him. He just he just receives it, right? Right, it's inherited. Um, and Although he wishes over and over that it hadn't. Right. Right? Yeah. It's, it's like, why me? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, there's something very, um, I will say, you know, a quick commentary. I mean, there's something very, um, like, I, I, see, I see some of, I see some kind of Catholic thought in this from Tolkien because, you know, one of the ideas, one, one, a, a big idea in Catholicism is that one good act um, sort of strengthens you for more good acts, Right. right? Right. And it and it helps you build up a resistance mm-hmm. to uh, to evil and to concupiscence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think that I think there's some of that in here that you know because Bilbo received it on really on overall good terms, um, he was he had more resistance to its effects built like kind of built up, right? right. Yep. Um, even though ultimately he kept, if he kept it for long enough, it would have had its way with him. Um, he, because of the way it came to him, it, it, it was kind of like that first, that first good act as opposed to Gollum who mm-hmm. did an evil act. And so he was just almost like completely given over to it yeah. and it completely had its way with him mm-hmm. very quickly. Very know? quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Not much time, not much time transpired. At least I think I got the, the feeling from reading this. That from the moment Gollum took possession of the of the ring, it was I mean it was a very short period of time yeah. before he was living under the mountains, right? He was right. expelled from his grandmother's house, and you know basically you know was living in a cave, right? Shunning the sun, and then it did not seem like much time had passed at all, right? Yeah, so no. it was a very very a quick demise for Gollum. I agree. I agree. Um, I think so. Um, I think it's really funny that we keep on getting these references to Sam being right outside the window. Yeah. Like, swimming. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Like, I know that Sam comes into the chapter towards the end and he gets, you know, Gandalf is like, oh, Sam's spying on us. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of like, really, Gandalf? Like, you, here you are with this, like, he, you know, you're all concerned about, like, who's hearing you telling these things. Right. And, like... We got to be sure we're in daylight, not in not in darkness. You know, right? And you're the enemy spies by... are everywhere, and like right. you hear somebody trimming the hedges outside, and you don't think to like close the windows right, exactly. and go into and a room with there. no window. Right? Exactly. You know, I was just kind of like, I was like, I, I I started thinking, I was like, so either that's kind of a little bit of a lapse in storytelling on Tolkien's part, or. He's basically saying that Gandalf was planning, was trying to pull Sam he's in to pull. the whole time. I think it's the latter. You know? I think he's trying to pull him in. I kind of think so, too. Yeah. 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 Um, or, you know, other thing, too, is he could maybe be, he could also, maybe this could be his way of of showing that Gandalf is not possibly infallible, right? Like, yeah. he makes mistakes just like everybody else. Yeah, he's an old, powerful wizard, but, you know, he's not perfect either. Right. Right. So it's kind of setting, maybe setting the stage for, you know, for maybe just making his mistakes more believable. But yeah. I think, I think more than anything, he's probably trying to, I, I think he wants, because I mean, it's, it's funny because when he finally does pull Sam in and he scares mm-hmm. Sam's, you know, to pieces, and I just laughed out loud when Sam's like begging him not to turn him into anything. Right. Crazy. Um, you know, and he's like, oh, okay, here's your punishment instead then. You have to go with Frodo. Right. Like, it seemed very, like... I don't know it, it seemed it's it seemed like it was it was it was planned. Yeah, but that's how Gandalf wanted it to be. Right. No, I I I think yeah I think so and um, we'll see. I can't remember if later on there's more there's more of an insight into that, but um, but yeah, I think I think Gandalf realized early on that if Frodo was going to need a friend and a companion, and I think he probably knew well enough that a because it talks about how Sam used to be one of the little hobbits that would that loved Gandalf stories and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. He knew Gan, he knew who Sam was, and 
he knew that Sam adored Frodo Mm -hmm. already. And so Mm -hmm. he was like, this is probably the perfect companion for Frodo. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And he's, he's also, not only does he adore him, but he's also very sort of, has a very subservient disposition towards him. So he's going to listen to him. And he's not going to be. already just because he's his gardener. Right. Right. And also, I think, too, I mean, like we talked about earlier, Sam is, um, you know, he's open to believing that these things are actually happening. Right? I mean, just right. That, from that conversation in the Green Dragon, um, he's like, yeah, he, he just has a, he's just more, he's more likely to believe that there's truly something bad about to happen. Right. He's not just going to laugh it off like the other people, maybe. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, why don't we pause there and take a break, and we will be right back with the rest of Chapter 2. Don't go away. Stay right where you are. Do you know the tale that Tolkien called the Colonel of the Middle-Earth mythology? Baron and Luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a Silmaril, one of the holy jewels of the Blessed Realm, from the Iron Crown of the Dark Lord Morgoth. In my new book, Tolkien's Requiem, I explore the legend of these doomed lovers. In doing so, I aim to provide a back door into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash b-e-r-e-n. Happy reading! All right, we're back. Um, so we're about halfway through this chapter, and you know, one of the things I said early on was Frodo, up to this point, is living this kind of idyllic life where, you know, he's the master of Bag End, and he, you know, he just kind of comes and goes as he pleases, and um, he's living a pretty sweet bachelorhood lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, he really is, and um, and then all of a the sudden, there's this great moment. Um, and Gandalf has already told him some about this ring, and um, and then finally Gandalf says to Frodo, he says, "This is the master ring, the one ring to rule them all. This is the one ring that he lost many ages ago to the great weight weakening of his power. He greatly desires it, but he must not get it." And then Frodo sits silent, motionless, and um, and like feels this like something rising towards him. And he says, this ring, how on earth did it come to me, right? It's like, you know, it's it's just sort of imagine yourself in those shoes and being like, this is, you know, you're just this, you're just this guy, you know, minding your own business off in a little corner of the world that nobody right. cares about. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, you've got some great, like, <laughs> secret that the great powers of the world are contending over. You know, you're you're you hold in your hand this thing that the great powers of the world are contending over, and you suddenly realize like, oh, my life is about to change, like my world is about to be rocked. Oh yes, big time to the core. And um, and you know, you see this where um, uh, Frodo again, you know, first he says, how how on earth did it come to me, and then uh, just a few lines later he says. I wish it need not have happened in my time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I can mm-hmm. think about, um, I think about like the different things that went on in Tolkien's lifetime, like World War One and World War Two, these great cataclysmic things. Mm-hmm. And probably people, Tolkien and, and people he knew probably said, you know, when Tolkien had a couple of his sons going off to the war, he was probably like, why did this have to happen in my lifetime? You know, yeah. why did this great war have to happen in my lifetime? Yeah. And um, when he lost friends in World War One, and he himself was in World War One, and um, you know was in combat, it's like, why does this have to happen in my lifetime, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, other 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 men's lifetimes have not had they've not had to go off and fight these wars, and now I have to go off and fight this war. So I feel like uh, again, like you, you always got to be careful when you're attributing things to Tolkien. He was telling he was telling a story first and foremost, but I feel like. He knew what this felt like very mm-hmm. deeply. Yeah, I can understand that. To to point. be in to be in Frodo's shoes right now. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I love I just love Gandalf's words to him. He says, "So do I, and so do all who live to see such times. 
but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I don't know. I just I just find those words really inspiring. They really move me. I would me. like put them on a yeah. poster and hang it. I mean, it's just you're not able to decide the things that the things that happen to you in your life. All you can do is control your reaction to them, right? And, yeah. um, and seek to do the thing that you're called to do. Yes. Um, yep. And, um, anyway, I, I just think that's I think that's a beautiful a beautiful line. Oh, by the way, here's that bit about the the, the dwarf rings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Seven the dwarf kings possessed, but three he has recovered. Sauron has recovered, and the other the others the dragons have consumed. Right. So that's what happened to the dwarf rings. Yeah. Um. All right. So, jumping at any questions? Any, any, yeah. Okay. Mm-mm. Jumping ahead. Why not? You should have questions. Should I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Let me find one. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> no, that's all right. No, no, I'm just no, just you know being. Why? Why wasn't it destroyed? Look, why? Why wasn't it destroyed? That's um, my question. Well, because it it had its effect on Isildur, right? Right. Oh, is that how you say that name? Isildur, yeah. Isildur. Isildur. I was saying Isildur. Yeah. I like that better. Right, yeah, it had yeah. its effect. Yeah. Good job. You got my question right. Yay, good for me. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, all right, so now we start learning more about Gollum. Uh, we get yes. into Gollum's story. Yes, Gollum. And, you know, as I was reading all this, I was like, and this has happened to me other times I've read it, how in the world... Did Gollum? Did, did Gandalf figure all this stuff out? You know what I'm saying? Oh, how did he get all the backstory? Backstory on Gollum, especially. You know. Well, he went and found him. Yeah, basically that's how it was, and and um, he gave him the he put him through the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, he, he literally <laughs> put the fear of fire in him. <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, yeah, a little bit a little bit after he starts telling the story, he says. Um, uh, doesn't he sound so sweet, though? Like, in that first paragraph, I was like, oh, he sounds what? so sweet. Like, how he just liked to dive down oh, yeah. and into yeah. pools well, and explore. Well, again, I think that's one of the masterful and... things that he does here, is he makes Gollum, he takes Gollum, he turns, he, Gollum in The Hobbit comes off as, for the most part, comes off as just a monster, you know? Right. It's like a petty monster, you know? There is a little bit, where is that, they do get that little backstory, right? They show him doing mm-hmm. the... You know, diving down and hanging out with with uh, Deagle or whatever. Well, no, I'm saying I'm saying when the Hobbit. Oh, the Hobbit. If you go yes. back to the yes, Hobbit, yes, yes. If you go back to the Hobbit, yes, that's right. Yes. And, and there are a few little minor things in there that that help us to sympathize a little more. And I mean, just the fact that he plays a riddle game with Bilbo and in, mm-hmm. in the Hobbit, it makes him a little more of a sympathetic figure. Yes. You know, he's he gives him at least a humorous streak, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. it gives him a little bit of a childlike flair. True. Um, yeah. But. Here, I think this is one of the great, the most masterful things Tolkien does is he makes Gollum into a tragic figure, right? Mm -hmm. That Gollum is, first and foremost, a victim of the ring. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, Now, and and I think that to me is is one of the really, um, like, great themes of, of this, of the work of The Lord of the Rings, is the way evil... Both we're like human beings, people as moral agents are both victims of evil and perpetrators of evil. Yes, it's like simultaneously every time we do something evil, we're sort of a victim of evil, but also that we carry it out, you know, and so mm-hmm. we're guilty of it, you know. Yeah. Um. And I really, I think, you know, but he, but he really makes Gollum seem more and more like a victim of evil first and foremost because here he is, this little. He's a hobbit, and and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's living this idyllic life, yeah. right? I mean, the, the the Jackson, the way he did it at the beginning of the Return of the King, and told this story at the, at the beginning of the Return of the King, like that to me is one of the master things, master bits of storytelling on Jackson's part was the way he fit that in at the beginning of the Lord of the Ring or the beginning of the Return of the King, the story of of Smeagol and Diggle, mm-hmm. right? That's where it was. I can remember yeah. where it was. Okay. And um, and uses that to set up, you know, to, to the effect of setting up Gollum as a more tragic figure. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
Gollum, uh, yeah, Gollum, he starts off sound, you know, sounding very sympathetic in the picture that Gandalf paints mm-hmm. of him. That he's just this, he's this character that just loved to dive down, and he's just a little Hobbit fellow. I mean, he was a, uh, he, just like Frodo or Bilbo, you right. know. And all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't actually a Hobbit, though, was he? He was no, he was a stork, right? Okay, so well, it says it well, says he, he was, was related a, to hobbits. Right? Yeah, it says, I guess they were of hobbit kind, akin mm-hmm. to the fathers of the fathers of the stores, for they love the river. So, it's not 100% clear. Maybe he was, like, you know, we don't really know entirely, where, like, who the first hobbit was or where they came from. It's it's mysterious, just like the origin of elves and the origin of men, ultimately, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, did they, like, evolve or something in this world? Like, Tolkien just is not interested in answering those questions for right. me, right? Right. For us. Um but we'll we'll just say he was hob he was definitely of Hobbit-like. Hobbit kind, right? Yeah. Um, Hobbit light, definitely. And um, so, but he, you know, they're out fishing, and then Daigle falls in the water, finds this ring, and the next thing Smeagol knows is, you know, he's the effect. The ring is working its effects on him. And okay. think about that. Like, here's this, you know. It's kind. Of, it's kind of like the stories I've heard of, um, where um, early, like in the days of um, nuclear power, when you know, there's this thing in nuclear power called a source, mm-hmm. and it's like a, it's like this little ball of like concentrated um, nuclear energy, and, and it's used to like calibrate different things and that okay. sort of thing. But it's extremely radioactive. Mm. Like you've got to you've got to be really super careful with it. And I think once or twice in the early days of, like, the American nuclear programs, um, you know, there were incidents where a person, like, that worked in the program would take something, like, would, would accidentally, like, take something like that home with them. Oh, wow. And, like, one, and, like, one of the occasions, like, a child found it, and and it oh, just, wow. you know, it's, you know, it had it just killed the child. And not instantaneously, but, like, fairly quickly, you oh, know. Wow. And it's, like... Um, that just yeah. sucks, you know. Wow. And um, and it's the same thing with with Smeagol. Like, here's this thing, this powerful, ev- powerful corrupting force towards evil. Right. And all of a sudden, he's just like basking in its glow, and he was not prepared for this, you yeah. know. Um, he was not ready to, you know, to to deal with this on a moral level. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, he has to, and he fails utterly, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so even though he is guilty of these things, he's also um, he's also very much a victim of them. Right. So yeah. I I think that's yeah that was that was very masterfully done definitely on Tolkien's part because you're you know you find yourself rooting for him not to do it like no no, no. you know yeah like, control yourself it's really not that great just let it go yeah um, but yeah he just can't help himself right. You just can't. It's and it was it was a little surprising to me how quickly how quickly it took control of him. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like he saw it and he wanted it, right? You know, and he wasn't going to let anything stop him. Yeah, which I found surprising because it really it just looks like a gold ring. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, there wasn't anything in its physical appearance that could have made him think that it was besides it being gold and shiny. I'm surely they see. I mean, they say that he was from a wealthy family. Right, so surely he would have seen jewels and rings and stuff like that. Well, but and, but remember too, there's this, and we haven't talked about this very much. I don't think we've talked about this at all yet, actually. But there's this aspect to the ring where it's infused with the will of Sauron, right? right. Like Sauron yeah. has literally poured some of his a good right, helping yeah, of his will and his life right. sort yes. of energy into this ring. So the ring has a will of its own, right? Mm, that's um, right. Yeah. And, and, and so it basically picked Gollum out to be like, because it's what it's trying to do is get back to its master. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And it basically was like, oh, this guy. Yeah. This guy can help me. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, here it was buried at the bottom of this river um, for a long time, and you know, it wanted to find its way mm-hmm. back to its master, mm-hmm. and it would use whatever means it needed to, mm-hmm. um, to do so. So. Um, it probably looked and said, "Oh, these you know these little puny things would would be convenient ways, at least, of me getting out of the river, and then I can you know I can kind of make it from there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be more easily found that way, 
Right. And right, um, being buried. Exactly. But um yeah, it's it's just it's like it's like a stepping stone mentality. It's like, well these you know, I'll devour these these people, you know, mm-hmm. quickly and sort mm-hmm. of eventually some an orc will find it or something like that and once the orcs find it eventually it'll find its way back to Sauron. Right. Um but uh but I think the reason it corrupted him so quickly was because he, he had to murder to get his hands on it, right? Because he, he unlike Bilbo who Yeah got it in a in a just way. Right, yeah. We talked a little bit about that already. Yeah. I guess just what was surprised me was that he saw it and wanted it. Right. You know, and it just it's not like it was this beautiful huge diamond that was you know, blue I mean it was just round band of gold, like Yeah, but these are simple creatures too, so yeah, I know, but like I said... I don't think they had lots of golden things. No, I don't think they did. I mean, I know his family was was more well-off, and his grandmother probably had some kind of jewelry that he'd seen before, but... I know, it just surprised me that he that he went after it as quickly as he did. Yeah. You know, but. Yeah. Well, I, I have kind of... Um, I have kind of a birthday theory that, uh, that goes back to the whole thing about hobbits giving presents on their birthdays hmm. um, that's connected to this. And, and this is not spelled out. This is just me kind of you know, speculating, but I think it's interesting nonetheless to, uh, and basically my thought is that, you know, here's this, here's this kind of ancient story of the hobbits. This is, this story happens over a thousand years before the time of Frodo and Bilbo. Oh, was it that long ago? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. And, um, uh, and here you have this, you know, this incident in this powerful family where this, um, where this one figure, Smeagol, Mm-hmm. murders another for this because he wants his birthday present, right? Mm. He wants his birthday present. Okay. And that made me think that maybe this ancient custom that the hobbits have of giving birthday presents on their birthdays is like this thing that they decided to do because of this ancient it's like a sin. Reaction it was like this? a reaction. It was like a it was like a it was like this horror thing that happened in their early communities. Mm. And it's it's this long ago thing that they don't even know the reason they do it anymore. It's just this custom they built up. Right. But they did it in response to, you know, we'll no longer to the birthday incident. Right? Almost as an atonement. Yeah. Kind of yeah, exactly. It's, it's huh, like a way, like a cultural atonement sort of thing. Yeah. That's a good thought. Um, yeah. And it's a way of ensuring that it never happened again, you know. Right. Right. No one will ever use this argument to hurt another another hobbit again. So... Um, nowhere that I know of does Tolkien connect those dots, but I just think it's interesting because Bert, because Tolkien Tolkien does a lot of things throughout his works that if at face value seem like oh that's just that's just a funny little thing that Tolkien put in there yeah but I don't think Tolkien I think I think it was extremely rare that Tolkien ever did it like that I think he always knew there was a backstory to everything you know. I, I mean, and I, I think have to agree with that. I just wonder if I wonder if Tolkien put that little detail in there as a way of connect is is a for something to sort of a little hint at a connection. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, could be. Um, could be. Yeah. Otherwise, the birthday thing is just kind of a whatever. You know, it's just an incident. Yeah, it doesn't really have much meaning or significance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, uh. Another thing, so we talked about Gollum as a tragic figure, and, the, and Gandalf agrees. He think, he says, I think it's a sad story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's interesting, though, how Frodo starts out viewing Gollum as, as a wretch, and he's just this wretched creature, mm-hmm. and he thinks he's deserving of death. Right. And from the begin, you know, from very early in the book, then, we have this, um, we have this war of two different mindsets when it comes to Gollum. One is... Frodo here who says he's a wretch and he deserves death and the other is Gandalf who says but there's still some spark of goodness in him yeah I remember Gandalf talking about that and he even says I think there's ho- there is hope there's not much right but there is still a chance that Gollum could be cured that he could come that he could come back from from this um you know from from these horrible things that the ring has done to him yeah and I was like wow Gandalf that's Thinking a lot. That's a lot of faith, right there. I mean, he's got to be. I mean, so you said that happened over a thousand years before, mm-hmm. right? So he's had the ring. Gollum has had the ring, right? Give or take a thousand years. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But Gandalf still thinks that there's hope for him. Yeah, he says even Gollum was not wholly ruined. He had proved to get tougher than even one of the wise would have guessed. 
as a hobbit might. There was a little corner of his mind that was still his own, and light came through it, as through a chink in the dark. Mm -hmm. Light out of the past. It was actually pleasant, I think, to hear a kindly voice again, bringing up memories of wind and trees and sun on the grass and such forgotten things. He's talking about his, um, like, his actual conversation with... Is he talking about... Is Gandalf talking about his conversation with Gollum, or is he talking about Bilbo's? I think he's talking about Bilbo's. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, because he, he refers to Bilbo in the previous paragraph. I see. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, again, you know, Gollum... Um, I, 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 this, this little snippet just after that of Gollum... Of something else Gandalf says about Gollum really resonated with me. All the great secrets under the mountains had turned out to be just empty night... There was nothing more to find out, nothing worth doing, only nasty, furtive eating and resentful remembering. He was altogether wretched. He hated the dark and he hated light more. He hated everything in the ring most of all. And that made me oh, think of, yeah. I mean, that just made me think of, um, like, I guess, a view of, like, people that, that start out and they're full of life and, um, but especially that kind of follow a road of, um, of, of, of an otherwise empty universe where it's just like you know um, the world is my oyster and then they get to the end of it and they're like and 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 through a series of events whatever um, they lose they keep losing things and they lose things and then they get to the end of it and they're like the joy is gone like all of the uh, all of the things that they hoped for you know again Smeagol was pointed as this was was painted as this individual who liked he was almost like a scientist he liked digging into things and uncovering mm-hmm. the roots of things right Gollum. yeah yes. yeah mm-hmm. you remember yeah and and then he gets you know here he is with this ring and all of the great secrets under the mountains had turned out to be just empty night right empty night. Yeah. he loved to go digging but now all of those great secrets he was looking for just turn out turn up empty yeah. um he has nothing nothing left of it he has no love right um and um, again, I can't help but see significance in that for for Tolkien. Um, I don't know. I don't want to go too far into it uh, right right now because I, I know we probably want to start wrapping up this chapter soon. But um, that's just a moving little passage to me because I feel like that could resonate with a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. That coming to the end of where everything seemed full of possibility and light at one point, and then all of a sudden it's like. It's like you're at the end of it, and you're like, "Where's all the meaning I was hoping to find? You know, where's all, where's the, to use the C.S. Lewis phrase, where's the further up and further in? You know, um, since, um, yeah. I, I do think of the Leaf by Niggle, um, character, the, uh, who at the end who sees everything, all of Niggle's work is worthless, and then, but there's Niggle, in Niggles Parish going further up and further in into the mountains and continuing forever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's no end to it. There's no end to that that joy of exploration and newness, right? Whereas the the modern, you know, kind of bureaucrat mindset is like, oh, it's just worthless nonsense, you know, all of that stuff that he was all about, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay. Yeah, no, that was, I remember, yeah, and I think, um, no, I, th- I think that's good stuff. Um, I mean, and again, it, it it really shows the extent of of the effect that the ring has had on him. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just you know, I mean, it's it's just it's just that feeling, like you said, of just. I mean, he he valued that thing so much, and he took the life of his dear cousin to keep it, and mm-hmm. now there's nothing to show for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like. It's like he he wagered everything to have this ring, which seems so so great, um, and he kind of centered his life. That's that's thank you. He kind of centered his life around this mm-hmm. thing. He built his life around this yeah. thing, and he had to kill his friend in order to do it. Yeah. And he was like, "Oh, I have my precious now," mm-hmm. and the precious tends to leave him. It, the precious ultimately leaves him empty. Completely you know? empty. Completely empty. Yeah. It just yeah. it just drains all of the light from him. Mm-hmm. Um, Wrong precious. Yes. <laughs> Not so precious after all. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, right after, so shortly after that, 
um, there's this great little passage about um, about providence and or about the forces at work and Bilbo finding the ring. Uh, Gandalf says, Behind that, there was something else at work, beyond any design of the ring maker. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker, in which case you also were meant to have it, and that may be an encouraging thought. Frodo doesn't understand, he just says it's not. Right. Uh, though I'm not sure I understand you. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, so who do you think is at work? Who do you think is at work that wanted Bilbo to find the ring? Yeah, I found that passage very curious. So I was like, wait a second. I thought, I thought, uh, Sauron? Sauron, yeah. Sauron's the bad guy. Okay. I thought Sauron poured his power into it, and he was basically, you know, like I said, like an evil puppeteer, right? Like pulling these strings to get the ring back to him. So then I was like, well, the the ring itself obviously has its own power. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I guess you mentioned before, you mentioned, like, destiny, Mm -hmm. right? Or providence. Is that, is that what it is? Or... What is that other force? I don't know if it's not Sauron. Well, I don't know that we're meant to know explicitly, right? Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, it's sort of like when when miraculous things seem to happen in our lives, right? Mm-hmm. Or utter coincidences. Utter coincidences seem to happen in our lives. Mm-hmm. We get the sense of something else operating, right? Yeah. Something else at work that we don't know for certain what it is. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. But we we just have this overwhelming sense that there's a, a stronger force at work. Like a divine. Right. A divine power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, serendipity. Uh, yeah. I don't know what is serendipity? I think that's I always, just a fancy word for coincidence, isn't it? Yeah, let's, let's Or destiny. I just remember that, that um, there's a movie. What does serendipity mean? The definition of serendipity is good luck in making unexpected and fortunate discoveries there you go Mm -hmm. good luck in making unexpected and fortunate discoveries that answer brought to you by Siri (laughs) (laughs) alright so um, that would be kind of like a um, that would be a more worldly um, explanation well there's plenty of there's plenty of times where they talk about luck Um, and luck does not luck you when you say luck, it doesn't mean that you're. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're saying that it wasn't God who brought it all about, right? Okay. Um, especially with Tolkien, like Tolkien likes the word luck. Hmm. Um, he he is a fan of the idea of luck. Okay. Um, for him, luck carries a lot more mystery than 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 just being like, oh, well, it's just a coincidence, you know, a random. Oh, it's, it's, okay. it's 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 he doesn't mean a random coincidence. Um, he means something that is inexplicable and is a coincidence, but it's more orchestrated. Yeah, it's not just we don't we don't we don't completely know mm-hmm. where it came from, but mm-hmm. you know, so we call it luck, right? right? Um, uh, and, and again, like I think you have a balance. You know that that's maybe where Sam is right now, right? Where he's in that sweet spot, I think, between credulity and and incredulity, where you know you're. you're an incredulous person would just be like, oh, just a random coincidence. You know, a credulous person would be like, oh, well, obviously that was Iluvatar orchestrating this and he pulled Bilbo over to this point and it was just get annoying later, like trying to like point out every single little He's thing. Trying to explain And being like, every, dude, yeah. you're not Iluvatar. You don't know the mind of Iluvatar. You don't right. know, you don't know all of these things. Mm-hmm. Gandalf probably knows that much better than you do and he doesn't even go there, mm-hmm. right? Because Ilu- mm-hmm. he recognizes that the designs are far greater than than he's able to mm-hmm. speak for. All he knows is that, is that from everything he can tell, it seems like some other benevolent actor wanted you to find, wanted Bilbo right. to find this ring. Right, right? exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, those so people that, that try to explain everything. It's yeah. Like, get over yourself, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, just admit that you are not the center of the universe and that there's something greater than you operating out there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, all right, um, yeah. So anyway, I love I love that passage. It reminds me a little bit of the very end of the Hobbit, um, which uh, Peter Jackson actually butchers, um, where uh, Gandalf basically 
Bilbo basically says, "Man, it's really kind of crazy everything I went through, and it all kind of." I don't have the I don't have the Hobbit here with me, so I don't have the line right. But he basically says something to the effect of like, you know, it's 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 sort of crazy to think I was swept up in all this stuff. What an adventure! And and Gandalf base sort of mildly rebukes him and says, "You don't really think that was all for your benefit, do you? Like just for your benefit, just so you mm-hmm. could have a good a grand adventure, do you? You know, there were far greater things going on than you realize." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that's the same the same Gandalf sort of thought coming through here is, yeah. you know, I don't even know what they were, but obviously there were much greater things going on than you realize. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. And instead of trying to figure them out, let's just. Yeah, and there's no there's no like well let's let's try and figure out the details of mm-hmm. of this other benevolent force. No, it's right. just like let's go do what we need to do. Right. Exactly. Let's follow the signs and. Right. Not. Not try to, not try to uh, figure things out that are above our pay grade, right? Yes. All right. Um, all right. And any other thoughts? I mean, there's so much more that I could yeah, that we could point out in this chapter. Um, and I don't want to. I don't want to suck all of the life and wonder out of it. Um, right. You know, if there's if there's anything we didn't cover that you. Th- that you, interesting points you want to bring up about this chapter, please do comment over at um, truemyths.org. Any other things, though, that you wanted to discuss or bring up or questions that you had, Greta? Yeah, just real quick, I was um, I was just looking over that, that, uh, that story where um, Gandalf is sharing about, about Gollum and how he actually wanted his precious back so much that he... He tried to go after it, right? Mm-hmm. Like he came out of the mountains and he actually tried to track Bilbo, and it turns out that he actually did get to the edge of the Shire, mm-hmm. or at least Gandalf thinks he did, but that something drew him away. Do we know what that might have been? Because remember, it says that the Wood Elves tracked him, tracked him, and that they were able to get him, that they were able to get that far, and then it turned away, and he was gone. Oh, see, and then that's where Gandalf says, and then I made a great mistake. Yes, Frodo, and not the first. Though I fear it may prove the worst, I let the matter be. I let him go. For I had much else to think of at that time, and I still trusted the lore of Saruman. So do you see what I'm asking? Do um, we know I'm, why? Why did he turn away? Um, or is that just another divine power thing? Um, I think, well, I think later on... Um, I think what drew him away was, um, was the lure of Mordor, and I think where does he talk about this? Um, uh, what he had been doing, he would not say. He only wept and called us cruel with many a golem in his throat. And when we pressed him, he w- he whined and cringed and rubbed his long hands, licking his fingers as if they pained him, as if he remembered some old torture. But I am afraid there is no possible doubt he made his slow sneaking way. Step by step, mile by mile, south, down at last to the land of Mordor. So the ring still had, obviously, some kind of hold on him. Yeah, well, and it says a little later on, Mordor draws all wicked things, and the dark power was bending all its will to gather them there. The ring of the enemy would leave its mark too, leave him open to the summons, and all folk were whispering then of the new shadow in the south and its hatred of the west. There were his fine new friends who would help him in his revenge. You know, so basically, Sauron was drawing all things back to Mordor, right? Sauron, Sauron had just reestablished himself in Mordor okay. and was drawing all wicked things there. Oh, I see. Okay. And Gollum felt that draw um, and was thinking to himself, oh, they'll help me get my revenge there. They, you know, this, this South, they hate the West. And, um, and that was why he turned there. I see. Okay. Got yeah. It. Got so. It. That makes sense. So basically the chapter ends then with, um, Gandalf basically charging Frodo or asking Frodo to make a choice, right? Are you going to be the one to destroy this thing or not? Right. Right? Um, and I, I really I really feel for Frodo here at the mm-hmm. end. Like, you can just feel the weight, mm-hmm. really. You know, and that, that, that thing, that passage that he that he shares at the end is just so, um, so thoughtful. He says, I should like to save the Shire if I could. Though there have been times when I thought the inhabitants too stupid and dull for words, and I have felt that an earthquake or an invasion of dragons might be good for them. 
But I don't feel like that now. I feel that as long as the Shire lies behind, safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there again. Mm-hmm. And and he goes on for a little bit, but I always thought that was just so incredibly thoughtful. And I think even Yendoff is impressed by it. Yeah. He's like, wow. I, I knew it. It's like I knew it was in there, right? You hobbits. You guys yeah. are surprising people. Um, yeah, Gandalf definitely loves the hobbits and mm-hmm. and believes in them when no one else does. You know. Yeah, yeah. But you can just feel, you know, you can just feel the weight of, of that that Frodo's carrying at this point. Um, and of yes. We have that funny instance with Sam. Yeah, I love Sam's last line there. <laughs> Me, sir, cried Sam, springing up like a dog invited for a walk. Me go and see elves and all? Hooray! He shouted and then burst into tears. <laughs> I, I don't know if... Um, I, I, I sort of wonder if Sam is both extremely joyful and extremely terrified, and that's why he burst into tears. I assume so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because he heard. I mean, he has an idea of what they're up against, right? Because he did hear what Gan- a lot of what Gandalf showed oh, yeah. Frodo oh, yeah. about, about the Mordor and the ring and, and all that and the, the cracks of... Um, the cracks of Mount Doom or whatever, cracks of Doom, and the terror of the fiery mountain. I mean, he heard all that, mm-hmm. right? So he's like, "Yeah, I get to see elves, but I won't die." Yeah, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yes, but there's going to be lots of dangerous things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Good we stuff. talked for a long time. We did well. Hey, our listeners stuck with us. It's a packed chapter. Um, it is so good. Yeah, really great chapter. Next time we will talk about chapter three. Um, three is company, and um, we're gonna. You know, it's it's funny. The next several chapters um, are very. They, when you read them after you've seen the movie several times, um, they strike you as like really unfamiliar. Like like basically, the next several chapters were just completely cut from the movie. Oh really? And um, okay. So they're they're really great in taking you out of feeling like you know the plot, mm-hmm. and and out of that mindset, and, and and kind of re-enchanting you with the depth of the whole cool. of the whole tale. So, cool. yeah, this is um, great stuff. We're, we're we're coming to. All so. right. All right. Well, thanks, Greta, and thanks Thank everybody you, for Tom. listening. And we shall look forward to talking to talking to you next time. Uh, don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes, and um, thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, thanks, guys. Talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes as well as other Tolkien goodness. Also, we hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as we enjoy making it. Please leave us a rating and feedback on iTunes. On the next episode, we continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings with Chapter 3 of Fellowship, Three is Company. Please tune in, and thanks for listening.